Welcome to the Road to 100 Million in Real Estate podcast, where you'll benefit from the opportunity to learn to become a skillful real estate investor. You'll get guidance from top industry producers, operators, and investors who are eager to help you learn from their proven strategies of success. Now to your host, Dorrance Constant. Hey, welcome everyone to another episode. I'm your host, Dorrance Constant. I've got another great guest on the show today. I've got Scott Lewis. Scott, welcome to the show. Thank you, Dorrance. Happy to be here. Great to have you, Scott. Scott is the co-founder and chief executive officer of Spartan Investment Group, LLC. As the CEO, Scott is responsible for strategic direction of the company and ensuring it aligns with SIG's mission to improve lives through our values. In addition to Spartan, Scott is also a U.S. Army vet, reserves, and a combat vet. Um, Scott graduated from Michigan State University with degrees in chemistry and marketing from Catholic Uni- from Catholic University with a U- MS in management and from Georgetown University with a certificate in project management. In his free time, Scott enjoyed spending time with his wife, Lindsay, mountain biking, skiing, chasing their Jack chasing their Jack Russell Terriers around the yard. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of fun, I bet. <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, uh, Scott, I uh, would like, love to, you know, thank you for you know, your service um, for us in our country. Well, I appreciate the support. Okay. And well, well, Scott, it so, sounds like you, you've had some incredible experiences. You in, you're in the services, you now moved past the services to investments. I, I imagine Scott, there's been a huge transition. I'd love to hear hear about it and share that. Have you share that with the audience? Yeah, I mean, um, I'm I'm actually still a current drilling Army reservist, um, so I, I still get the opportunities to learn a little bunch of stuff that the Army has to teach, and then bring it here into Spartan. Um, my transition off of active duty happened about ten years ago, and it was a really good uh, transition. I went into the federal government and those two experiences enabled me to build a lot of the skills that I've um, employed here uh, as the CEO of Spartan to kind of, to get us to where we were, where we are today. Absolutely. I, I imagine you, in your career, you've had to lead teams, right? You've had to set a, set a, a clear vision and have folks follow that vision. And I imagine that's uh, definitely translated into your life as a, an executive. Is that right? Absolutely. You know, kind of my, from the, from the time I, I came out of college, I have been building a set of skill sets that I think prepared me here for today. Um, you know, I, I, I wasn't an entrepreneur in my youth by any means. I didn't have a lemonade stand. I didn't mow lawns or anything else like that. And I think I kind of came to entrepreneurship um, through I don't know the not not a not a desire to be an entrepreneur. I'm I'm not a serial business developer. I I really have no interest in having multiple businesses. I'm just that's just not. I I would never describe myself as an entrepreneur. I did it mainly because I hated everybody else I worked with, and mm. those environments were just not conducive to what I wanted to do. So I kind of I did it basically uh, almost didn't have another choice if I wanted to not if I wanted to create an environment. So I really started building those skill sets around leadership and kind of some of the more tangential, non-technical skills that a leader has. Um, and that's really served me well over the last you know, seven or eight years for Spartan. Gotcha. Gotcha. So you, you, so it sounds a little, so this wasn't a, a big desire from, you know, being a kid, uh, maybe idolizing a, a Warren Buffett or what have you, you just uh, felt like, Hey, this is, this is what I need to do in order to have some form of maybe sanity. <laughs> I, it it, it really peace. was. Yeah. Okay. I, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Go ahead. I, I think as a kid, I would have looked at the the name Warren Buffett and thought that was a buffet, not a, <laughs> not a buffet. Right. I, I have no entrepreneurs in my family. Uh, I'm the apple that kind of fell off the tree, rolled down the hill, landed on a truck and drove away. Um, mm-hmm. So it really kind of came to it because I saw a lot of things in the the civilian job I had before I joined the military. A lot of stuff in the army, obviously, that didn't make a lot of sense to me. Went into the federal government, and I was a very senior federal government employee. And there's a lot of hardworking federal employees. There's a lot of absolute mismanagement there, and management practices that are better suited for the 40s and 50s versus the 2020s. It's just 
it was just silly some of the stuff that i saw so i just didn't want to be a part of that anymore and, and frankly I, I didn't want to keep jumping around with with hoping that i landed in a in a in an establishment that didn't quite frankly suck and i was kind of tired of that so that's really where you know, i met my my partner ryan and we just decided to build something that didn't suck so it's our our the, the original vision for spartan was to build a place that didn't suck um mm. you know it's not it's not some grand vision it's not it's not that hard to do that it's just the hard thing is really trusting the process and trusting what is written in the business books and, and actually implementing that in inside your organization and being okay with it so so that's very interesting right you wanted to build a business a place that didn't suck right <laughs> those are technical terms. those are technical terms <laughs> yes yes you can re read about it in jim collins good to great good to great equals doesn't suck it's i'm right. sure he wrote i'm sure it's in the book somewhere it's gotta be right gotta be if not man you may just need to put an insert in there <laughs> that's copyrighted so nobody on your no no listeners can take that so help me understand help me understand scott so you you get that you start with that now help, help me understand how your vision built um from 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 that space because you you've grown an organization at some point i'm sure it just didn't suck it and there had to be some levels up that you went there help us with that so i i think we really kind of started with the foundation of there's a there's a a management theorist i can't remember his first name but mcgregor it was around the the 60s when he came up with McGregor his, his theory was theory x versus theory y and it was kind of two management ideologies theory x was very uh, industrial age butts and seats like mo like uh, workers are very unmotivated you have to watch them you have to manage their times so they're not very smart versus theory y which is your more information kind of like knowledge worker uh, type ideology where people are inherently motivated. They want to do a good job. If given the tools, they can kind of self-guide. And I'm very much a McGregor theory. Why? So when you think about that, mm -hmm. when you're, when you think about establishing kind of your culture right out of the gate, because you don't get a choice, you're going to have a culture inside your organization. So you can either look at it as a strategic kind of investment to make sure you get the culture you want, or you can pretend that it doesn't exist and that a culture will develop that you can't control. We came at this that we would rather control the culture and leverage McGregor theory why in regards to how we're going to establish kind of our, our overall culture and vision for the organization. Wow. So take us through the steps that you took to be able to start as, you know, getting the vision for that culture and then actually implementing that culture within your, your organization. Yeah. So the, the vision, you know, that's when, when you look at any of your operating systems out there, you got Vern Harness, you got Gina Wickman. There, there's, there's a number of different authors that talk about a business operating system. Jim Collins does in many of his books. It, it, it's really written about. There is no secret sauce out there. Everything that an entrepreneur needs to build and establish a really good culture has been written about. It's just out there. It's about aggregating all those ideas and then actually doing it mm -hmm. so you know like you, the, the the process is is establish your mission and vision it doesn't matter what it is you've just got to establish it to be very clear mm -hmm. day one we were very clear that we didn't want to have a normal organization we wanted to have an organization that paid attention to our to our team from personal and professional perspectives. So me being an army dude and my uh, my uh, business partner, Ryan, being an airline pilot, both of us come from organizations that ask a lot of their people. Pilots are gone a lot. Soldiers are gone even more. Mm -hmm. So when you think about that, and, and you know, I saw it happen a lot that soldiers were taken away from their families a year at a time, right? That's kind of what we did when we deployed to combat zones. Well, if you didn't figure out, if you didn't create the infrastructure to take care of the soldier personally professionally they were a mess right 
right. I had I had a couple of soldiers come to me during deployment with the whole Dear John letter, right? The the quintessential. She cleaned me out, took all my money, and is leaving me. Like that's a real thing that happens. So when obviously when that happens, the soldier's a disaster and like and actually quite a liability to the unit. So when we think about that. Like, yeah, like in the corporate side of the house, we're not, it, it's not wartime and it's not people flying all over the place for like uh, over and over and over and over again. But sometimes there is. If you just look at the person as a professional and you pretend that we're not human beings and we're not all dumpster fires in our one way, shape or another, because we all are, mm-hmm. you, you get half the person when they show up to the organization. And it, it's just, it's not a good recipe for, for, extreme growth and extreme success so when we looked at establishing our vision we looked at the whole person and tried to create an environment where people could grow personally and professionally right so you were able to create a culture where people not only see themselves as professionals knowing that you you folks don't just see them as professionals but you actually see them as human beings who have personal lives what benefit would you how would you describe that benefit that's brought to your organization so I think when you think about that, when when you try to decouple the personal and the professional, you get someone that is straddling two sides of a fence and is constantly trying to figure out how to not fall on one side or the other, right? Mm-hmm. When you think about that work-life balance, which to me is an absolute anomaly, it, it's, it's a fallacy. There is no such thing as work-life balance if you're going to drive and you're going to achieve something great. It's just not. Mm-hmm. Like, you have to figure out how to do both. Now that like that, so some people love that concept of work-life balance. I don't, because I think there's a trifecta. There's a personal, a professional, um, and then there's there's also like what you want to achieve out of family, work, kind of spirituality, if that's your thing. And 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 I'm a big proponent of you can't have all three completely in balance. It's just mm-hmm. just not a thing. You're mm-hmm. always sacrificing something for something else. It's making hard choices. But if you understand from a leadership perspective of what those choices for your team members are, you can help kind of facilitate them to be easier. I'll give you an example. Sure. So one of them for, for we do something called a performance enhancement plan. It's a one year basically like individual strategic plan for, for the for the person, right? For for an individual. And on there, there's there's goals, personal and professional goals. Okay, so I see that one of my uh, folks that reports to me wants to wants to do spend more time fishing with his son. Right, that's a thing. That's what he wants to do. So when I see that and I understand that, I can, hey man, like if you're traveling to say Florida to visit a bunch of our properties. Why don't you stay a weekend there and have your family meet you in Florida and do this really fun fishing trip with your son? Right. Mm-hmm. So I understand that and I can create the freedom and flexibility so that that person feels that they're all right to be able to do that. And then I've got a I've got a two for right. I get two for one. I've got a team member pushing to Florida to go and and do some property visits and do what they need to do. But at the same time, this enabling that team member to take this epic fishing trip with his son to charter a boat because they're they're in Tampa or, or they're not far away from that, right? Right. So like his son can fly down there and, and meet him or his family can come down there and meet him at the end of the trip. And then like that's the understanding of knowing your people intimately, personally and professionally. Well that's a, it's it's a it's a it's very astute of you to actually think of, you know, how you can mesh right some of the personal personal goals and vision that that person has and also align it with the with the type of work uh, and goals that they need to accomplish in the professional field and i imagine that just creates a a higher level of motivation excitement Uh, imagine using that example instead of that person thinking hey man i'm now i've just got to drive all the way down to tampa they've got a great level a new level of motivation Whereas, hey, I can actually bring my family, I can have a fishing trip. And guess what? My, you know, my employer, my, the leader of my company is actually encouraging me to do this, right? So I, I imagine that boosts the morale of the, your organization to a whole nother level. 
of, of you're you're exactly right. And there's a book out there called Multipliers. So it's, it's a fantastic book. I recommend folks read it. And it talks about a lot about getting the hundred and ten percent out of people. It's it's when they were when they were doing their research for for the book, the I give hundred and ten percent was referenced over and over again. The mathematicians out there will argue that you can't give 110%. That's not a thing, right? So colloquially, we know what that means to really kind of go the extra mile. So when you think about coupling that with the old adage that people don't care what you have to say until they know you care, when you think about that from a leadership perspective, if you understand and know your people, they're more likely to A, go that extra mile, and then B, under like really kind of listen to you deeply and and ideas go further there's more motivation there's just it's a better environment and really there's really no reason not to do it you uh, you can pretend if you're a leader that folks aren't going to be talking at the water cooler and taking time off and all this other stuff you can pretend that that's not that's not happening but it is so if you, instead of pretending that it's there, you accept that it's happening, you can control the environment and you can provide those, those opportunities for people to do both of the things that they want to do. But the vast majority of folks that are out there in the workplace, they're team members, they're not entrepreneurs, they're not, they're not executives or whatever. So they're, they're not living, they're not like living to work they're working to live and now they may be they may be driven by the purpose and the mission of the organization but for the most part they're they're doing it to facilitate their personal lives right most folks do that right Mm -hmm. um and their intrinsic motivation when you tie that into maslow's hierarchy of needs and getting into the self-esteem and self-actualization level of those needs that's what they're doing it for so if you understand that and you prefer provide that opportunity for them to, to couple both their personal and professional life where they, where they don't have to be, you know, they don't have to take PTO to go do something. Cause that's just silly. Um, then you can really drive that motivation and get more out of a smaller team. Oh, that's a, that's a fantastic point because then when you're, you're doing that, you're, you're not only helping your organization, you're helping the individual as well. And, and, let, let's face it, everyone, most people have worked for an organization that sucks, as you call it, right? Yeah. right? And now to not be in, a, be in an organization that is actively trying to not suck, right? I can imagine there's a great deal of appreciation and wanting to stay, right, within an organization and provide the best that he can so they can be of value and show a, a form of, I would say, even reciprocity. Yes, they're getting a paycheck. But there's an appreciation, I, I imagine, that's coming from that as well. I, I think that's, you know, that's probably the case for 95% of the Spartans that we have. You know, we we have an ideology that ideally we'd have Spartans for life. And if we can't, we want to facilitate those folks going someplace where they can grow. I've actually said that, like, hey, you've been a fantastic Spartan and you want to get a promotion and I don't have place, uh, room for you because we're, we're a smaller company. I will personally pick up the phone and call the CEO of the other company that you want to go work for. And I will recommend that they hire that person because it's, it's about growth. Now we expect that Spartan to come back to us at some point in time when we grow. So it's more of a boomerang strategy than anything, but there's no reason people have to be jumping around to different companies and different jobs we, I think we've, we've lulled ourselves into a false sense of why people are doing that. And there's plenty of millennials out there that would be perfectly fine working for the same company their entire life if they could keep continuing to grow mm-hmm. and keep achieving their personal and professional dreams. There's one thing that's, that's pretty standard about, about human beings, and that's we don't like change. Most of us are really against it, right? Like right, very absolutely. much against it. Some of us are more willing to do it than others, of course, but but none of us are super big fans of it. So changing jobs, changing locations and everything else, like that's a super stressful time. So if you can create the environment where people can continuously grow, you can keep them in your organization. And if they're the right people for the organization, then you can provide a better experience for everybody in there. You can provide more thorough due diligence for your investors because you have 
team members that are seasoned. You can provide better underwriting. You can provide better operations for whatever you're doing. You can provide better internal systems and processes for your team because people have been there for a long team of time. I'm not I'm, I'm not sharing any like great wisdom here that turnover is a bad idea, but there are ways to reduce turnover that really aren't that hard. Awesome. You, you know, it sounds like you've got a, a great system in place there. And we were talking a bit oh, offline a bit about some of your use of the entrepreneurial operating system. I'd love for you to get into, you know, that, you know, what, what that system is and why you chose it and even how it's impacted your business. So I am a strategic planner by training. So we actually, we don't use any one particular system. We're not, we, we don't, we didn't implement traction. We didn't implement scaling up. We built ours up from the ground up. We use bits and pieces of kind of everything out there, plus some of the internal kind of mechanics that I've developed kind of on my own. Um, hopefully over the next like year or so, we, we are going to draft kind of a document that really lays out our operating system because we think it's a pretty good one. So when you think about it, they, they all start the same way. And the foundation is to establish your mission, vision, and values first before you do anything. Mm -hmm. And then you know, for us, a lot of the a lot of the business books out there talk about strategy and tactics, mm -hmm. but they miss something. So in the military, in the army, we have three levels to take a look at. We have strategic, operational, and tactical. So when you think about that, the tactical, pretty well known, right? It's, it's, it's where the metal meets the meat down on, on, on the ground, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody understands that. The strategic is that kind of that 30,000 foot view of, of the overall. But where I think a lot of organizations and a lot of the materials out there kind of fall flat a little bit is they don't talk about operations. Mm -hmm. And operations is really that kind of that middle management layer that has to connect the dots between the high level executives and the strategic view versus with the boots on the ground tactical view. And that's really aligning resources, both capital, uh, both physical and human resources, along with financial resources to really connect those dots between the strategy and the tactics. So when you look at us, we, pu we publish our strategic plan on the website. And a lot of people are like, why do you do that? And I'm like, well, because I know that if I just put a strategic plan out there and people don't know how to connect the very high level strategy, because it's fairly broad, it's over three years, with mm -hmm. what they need to do tomorrow through operations, which is aligning resources between the boots on the ground and the strategy, I'm not worried about people in, in taking our plan and going to do it. Right. Mm. It's, it's like the idea of putting out like, oh, I'm going to safeguard my idea because I'm, I'm really worried about it. I, like the, the amount of original ideas that are happening right now, pretty low. I'll give you an example. It's funny. I'm driving to the airport yesterday and we passed by Paradise for Paws. It's a, it's a, a dog boarding place right near the airport. In 2012, from uh, one of my master's degree projects, we came up with boarding gate kennels. It was a dog grooming place or dog boarding place right on the way to the airport. Something tells me that those entrepreneurs that started Paradise for Paws didn't jump into my master's class and steal my idea. They right. probably had their own idea, but they went out and did it. I, I had that idea, but I didn't do anything with it. So um, that's kind of why when, when we look at our, our strategic plan out there and our operating system, we really have built it around having a high level strategy, mid level, mid level operational plans, and then very granular tactical plans. Oh, that's awesome. So it, essentially it sounds like uh, you're, you're aligning your strategic plan with mi middle level of management, as well as on the, on the ground to accomplish the goal as a whole, but make certain there's a very transparent or organization you have there where everyone from the, t uh, from the top levels of leadership, um, to folks who are executing on a daily basis are 100% on the same page. So the actual term that we use is called nesting. Every one of our levels of plan are nested with the other plan. So like there's nobody kind of off the reservation kind of doing their own thing. When you look at the, so we have three levels of plans. We have a strategic plan, 
we have operational plans and we have our performance enhancement plans, which are at the individual level. So when you think about it, we have a strategic level, which is a corporate level plan. We have the operational level, which is department level plans. And then we have the individual with our performance enhancement plans. Every single one of those plans nests with the next higher level up plan. So you will see, like if I was to take you through and show you our strategic plan, our overall operational plans and individual team members performance enhancement plans, you could see like kind of part bits and pieces of the strategic level goals in people's day to day that they're working on. And awesome. if it doesn't align, you don't do it. Got it. Now let's, let's talk for, let's uh, speak to the investor. How has that helped you with picking the right investments and making certain that your investors at the end of it are happy and satisfied with the results? Well, I think it's one of those things, it's focus. You know, there's like in the real estate space, you go to these conferences and you meet these people that are like squirrels on meth. They're just all over the place, right? Just running around doing all this. I'm, I'm in 27 different asset classes and all this other stuff. And like, that's okay if you're Blackstone and you have 2000 people. Yeah, you can do 27 different asset classes. Mm -hmm. But for us, when we started, like focus, 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 that's really what has enabled us to really kind of pick the, I'm not going to say the best investments because like uh, I, I'm going to say the investments that work for us. And we created a strategy pretty early on that we were going to do self-storage in secondary and tertiary markets. And we were, go we're going to add additional asset classes, but we're going to do it at the right time. So for us, for our investors, having that focus and you know, our last strategic plan was from 2020 to 2022, and we just launched a new one. So in 2019, when we went through the process to build that prior plan, we said we were going to have three asset classes. Well, we don't. So we get asked all the time, well, why don't you, why don't you do the other two? Because we had so much opportunity in storage, we didn't want to divide our attention. So as we were building our company and kind of growing from a very small team to a team now at like 115, now we have the ability to go out there and 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 keep our focus on self storage, but still look at a couple other asset classes because we have the resources to be able to do that versus getting distracted. Fantastic! Now, that, that's that's incredible, right? Because you are you basically showed that though you can have you know that plan, you can have your strategy. That doesn't mean you're a hundred percent rigid, right? Where there's no form of flexibility to be able to do what's the highest and best use for time, energy, and finances for yourself, as well as all of the shareholders involved. Is that about right? It is. You know, the, the, the metaphor we like to use is the stiff tree breaks in the wind versus the flexible tree can survive the windstorm, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's funny. I, I live in the mountains, you know, in Colorado, and we, we get these wicked windstorms that come through, and I'm watching these lodgepole pines just kind of sway back and forth, and they're moving a decent amount. They're probably moving 12 to 18 inches at the top, which for, uh, you know, a 12 to 18 inch tree is a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking about it, but at the same time, you run into that tree if you're out here skiing, and it's going to be a bad day. Mm -hmm. um, but at the, the, when you look at that, you have to be solid enough in your roots and flexible enough to adapt to your operating environment. I think a lot of people give up, um, as I'll, I'll quote Napoleon Hill, three feet from gold. They work at it, they work at it, and they like, you know, they've done a lot of the right things. And we're a pretty impatient culture nowadays. So they give up. So I'll say you have to have some flexibility, but you also have to have the rigidity in your kind of in your planning. Jocko Willink really talks about this type of concept in the dichotomy of leadership. You have to be flexible, but rigid at the same time. Absolutely. All right. So we're winding on, down on time, but uh, got a question for you. If you could uh, wave a magic wand and start and change any one thing in your career, what would it be and why? I would go back to my first job out of college. I was a regional sales manager for a biotech company and I put about 60,000 miles a year on my car. So that's how much windshield time I had. Mm -hmm. And this was in 2003, so 2003 to 2007. So for four years I did this and I made the 
terrible, terrible mistake of not using books on CD at that time, CDs. For some of your younger <laughs> listeners, those little silver disc things that used to have stuff on them. I know it's like, and you had to, you'd be ripping down the road and having like 27 of them on your seat next to you, hoping that you found number nine after number yep. eight, right? <laughs> like, but at the same, like I, I, all that time, it's what I talk to our young people about. It's like, if you're in the car and you're a driven professional and your radio is on, you're wrong. Because every time you get in the car nowadays, it should be a podcast or an audiobook. Otherwise, you are failing yourself because you're not growing enough because music is not helping you to achieve your goals. So if I had, if I could wave a, wave, wave a magic wand, I would go back to when I was 23 years old. I would gather up the 487 CDs that it would take me to rip through a bunch of business books and I'd put them in the trunk of my car. That's what I would do. <laughs> I think that's great advice, right? Like when we've got our downtime, you know, there's, there's times to just enjoy yourself, but you can, you also use that downtime uh, to improve yourself in, in, in many different ways. I, I always go by the saying, like what we do today is what changes our tomorrow. The average person reads three books per year. The average CEO reads 12. So at Spartan, it's a minimum of 12 CEO, it was 12 books for our uh, team members to read. And when you break that down, 12 books is approximately 10 pages per day. So if you're a normal reader, 10 pages should take you about 15 minutes if you're a normal reader, maybe 20 if you're a little bit slower. So anybody that comes to me that owns a TV, has a social media app on their phone and tells me that they don't have 20 minutes per day to read a book, they are not Spartan material and they're just simply lying to themselves. Awesome. Now, thanks for dropping so many gems with us today. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure our listeners are going to want to connect with you. Uh, would you please let us know some of the best ways to uh, connect with you? Yeah, for folks that are interested in, in learning more about our investments, the best way to do it is to go to our website. It's spartan-investors.com. Throw your information in there and one of our investor relations people will reach out to you. That's the same place if you're interested in joining our team. We're always looking for new people. We are. We have several job openings and that's a good way to get, get us there and join our team. All right, fantastic. Well, Scott, it's really been a pleasure connecting with you today, learning more about your story and some of the uh, ways that you've made certain to lead your team through a clear vision and clear execution. Thanks so much for being on the show today. Appreciate it. Really appreciate the opportunity to be a guest and thank you. We trust that you enjoyed today's show. Visit archcapital.ventures to learn more about how you can leverage real estate investing to improve your life through passive income, financial freedom, and generational wealth.